Hi history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of history. Today on History Calling we're looking at the royal fertility problems of the Tudors, specifically Henry VIII and the many women he had or attempted to have children with. We'll look at how many pregnancies Henry was responsible for, at how they ended, and at the most popular medical theories which have sought to explain how a man who married six times and had at least three or four additional mistresses produced only four children who survived infancy. These theories include syphilis, the rhesus phenomenon, Kell syndrome, and impotence on Henry's part. Producing a male heir was one of Henry's obsessions, but it was to prove excruciatingly difficult for him. Let's find out why that might have been. Please remember to give this video a like and subscribe to the channel with notifications switched on so you never miss an upload. There's also a link in the description box for my Instagram if you'd like to follow me over there, my username is History Calling, and additional links for some books, documentaries and TV shows all about Henry and his wives. Let's begin by establishing how many pregnancies we know, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Henry fathered during his lifetime, and how those pregnancies ended. By far the greatest number of them were with his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Henry married Catherine on the 11th of June 1509 when he was just shy of 18 and she was 23. 33 weeks later she miscarried their first child, a girl, on the 31st of January 1510. We don't know exactly how far along she was in her pregnancy but the fact that the baby's gender could be determined would suggest at least three to four months. Catherine's doctors somehow convinced themselves that she had lost only one of a set of twins however as her abdomen remained swollen but this was not the case. She did, however, become pregnant again very quickly, and on New Year's Day, 1511, she delivered a son, Prince Henry, to the great joy of his parents. Tragically, this little boy died on the 22nd of February from an unknown ailment. On the 17th of September, 1513, she delivered another boy, but he lived only a short time. Sir John Dewhurst, writing in 1984, I'll leave details of his article in the description box, has speculated that this baby was premature, as King Henry was in France at the time, expected to remain there until the 21st of October, and presumably would not have left Catherine if he thought the birth was imminent. Pregnancy number four ended in November 1514, with the delivery of a son at eight months gestation, who was either stillborn or died soon after birth. Pregnancy number five produced Catherine's only surviving child, Princess Mary, who was born on the 18th of February 1516. The Queen's final pregnancy ended with the loss of a girl, again at about eight months gestation, who was stillborn on the 10th of November 1518. Despite being not quite 33 at the time, we never hear of Catherine being pregnant again. Henry's next child was born, not to his wife, but to his teenage mistress, Elizabeth, or Bessie, Blunt. This was Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond, who arrived on the 15th of June 1519 and who was the King's only acknowledged illegitimate child. Henry also took Mary Boleyn, the sister of his future wife Anne, as a mistress at some point in the early 1520s. However, we know very little about this relationship and although some have speculated that one or both of Mary's children might have been fathered by the King, he never acknowledged them as his and so they are not going to form part of this discussion. There was now a long gap before Henry became a father again, as he gave up trying to procreate with Catherine and spent the latter part of the 1520s and early 1530s trying to annul their marriage so that he could wed Anne Boleyn. When this was finally achieved, Anne became pregnant by him three times. The first resulted in the birth of their daughter, Princess Elizabeth, on the 7th of September 1533. The second ended in a premature or stillborn child of unknown sex in the summer of 1534. The third ended with the loss of a boy at about 15 weeks gestation on the 29th of January 1536. Incidentally, if you'd like to learn more about Anne's childbearing record, including the theory that her second pregnancy was a phantom pregnancy and why I don't believe she miscarried in 1535, though some others do, see my video on this topic, which I'll leave linked on screen and in the description box. Henry is also known to have had an affair with Anne Boleyn's cousin, either Mary or Margaret Shelton, in the 1530s, but again, no child resulted. 
There were further rumours of an infidelity with an unnamed woman during his marriage to Anne, but again no children. The king's final child was therefore Prince Edward, born to Jane Seymour on the 12th of October, 1537. Queen Jane then died 12 days later. Despite living over nine years longer and marrying a further three times to Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard and Catherine Parr, there is no record of any woman ever falling pregnant by Henry again, though Catherine Parr was clearly capable of conceiving as she did so after Henry's death when she was married to her final husband, Thomas Seymour. What we have then is a list of 11 pregnancies fathered by Henry between 1509 and 1537 and mothered by four women. These resulted in four daughters, six sons and one child by Anne Boleyn of unknown sex. Of these children, only five survived childbirth and its immediate aftermath, and only four, two sons and two daughters, lived past eight weeks. I've often read, including in the comments sections of other videos I've done on Henry and his wives and children, that some people think that he had problems in conceiving sons. But as these statistics show, that actually isn't true. He conceived more boys than girls. The two problems he had were first that so many of his children were not carried to term by their mothers and as a result were miscarried, stillborn or died soon after birth. And second, that after Jane Seymour conceived Edward at the start of 1537, Henry apparently never impregnated any woman again. The rest of the video is going to explore the most popular theories as to why these two issues might have occurred. Theory 1. Impotence on Henry's part. This theory really only relates to the later part of Henry's life from the mid-1530s onwards. As we've seen, he and Catherine conceived at least six times in nine years between 1509 and 1518, followed by the conception of Henry Fitzroy also in 1518. Henry and Anne conceived Elizabeth very quickly in late 1532 when they finally began sleeping together and Anne was pregnant once again within three or four months of Elizabeth's birth. From about 1534 or 1535 though, we might start to wonder if Henry was having problems in the bedroom department. After losing her baby in mid-1534, Anne did not conceive again until October 1535. And according to a letter written by the Imperial Ambassador Eustace Chapuis on the 18th of May 1536, she had complained that Henry had, quote, neither vigour nor virtue between the sheets. Still, Henry and Jane were married at the end of May 1536 and conceived Edward in January 1537, so any problems don't seem to have been too pronounced just yet. It was when Henry married Anne of Cleves in January 1540 that his issues really became apparent. He himself admitted that he was unable to consummate the marriage, though he blamed this on his 24-year-old wife, saying that she was unattractive, an accusation which I don't think is borne out either by her portraiture or by the comments of others who saw her. The idea that the problem lay with Henry is given further weight by his failure to conceive with either of his two remaining wives. The teenage Catherine Howard and Catherine Parr, who was in her early 30s and who had never conceived that we know of despite two previous marriages, but who, as I've already mentioned, did become pregnant and give birth to a daughter during her fourth marriage, though the after effects of the birth killed her. Impotence on Henry's part, starting in the mid to late 1530s, therefore seems like a plausible reason for his lack of children after Edward but it doesn't explain the loss of so many little Tudor princes and princesses in the 27 years before that. Theory 2. Henry VIII had syphilis. This theory is another one which I've seen repeated in a lot of comments on other videos I've done, and explaining it is actually one of the reasons I wanted to do this video, as I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about Henry and this illness. The idea that the king suffered from syphilis and that he passed it to his wives, causing the childbearing problems Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn faced, may be traced to an 1888 paper by Andrew Curry, which was published in the Edinburgh Medical Journal. It has been widely panned by modern doctors, however, as having no basis in any contemporary evidence. To understand why the illness almost certainly didn't afflict the Tudor royal family at this time, I'm going to start by explaining what it is and how it presents. According to the American agency, the CDC, that's the Center for Disease Control, syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease which can have four stages, primary, secondary, tertiary, and latent. 
Symptoms during the primary phase can include, quote, a sore or sores at the original site of infection. These are normally round, firm and painless. They can heal up within three to six weeks, even if you are not treated and cured of the illness. The CDC website, which I've linked below, continues. During the secondary stage, you may have skin rashes and or mucous membrane lesions. This stage usually starts with a rash on one or more areas of your body. The rash can show up when your primary sore is healing or several weeks after the sore has healed. The rash can look like rough, red or reddish brown spots on the palms of your hands and or the bottoms of your feet. The rash usually won't itch and it is sometimes so faint that you won't notice it. Other symptoms you may have can include fever, swollen lymph glands, sore throat, patchy hair loss, headaches, weight loss, muscle aches and fatigue, feeling very tired. The symptoms from this stage will go away whether or not you receive treatment. The website also points out that most people with untreated syphilis do not develop tertiary syphilis. However, when it does happen, it can affect many different organ systems. These include the heart and blood vessels and the brain and nervous system. Tertiary syphilis is very serious and would occur 10 to 30 years after your infection began. In tertiary syphilis, the disease damages your internal organs and can result in death. Just to make things even nastier, if untreated, this disease can, at any time, quote, spread to the brain and nervous system, neurosyphilis, or to the eye, ocular syphilis. If it does the former, the patient might experience headaches, a loss of muscle control, paralysis, numbness, and dementia. If it does the latter, the patient will lose vision and perhaps even become blind. The latent phase is when one is infected but presenting no symptoms. Finally, the disease can be a serious problem for pregnant women as it can lead to an underweight, premature or stillborn baby. So now that we have an understanding of the variety of ways in which syphilis can ruin your life, let's think about why it's unlikely Henry and his partners had it. First and foremost, other than their lost pregnancies, neither Henry, his wives, nor his mistress, Elizabeth Blunt, are known to have displayed any of the classic symptoms of syphilis. We hear no reports of rashes or lesions, weight loss or hair loss. During the course of their lives, I'm sure all of them did, on occasion, have a sore throat, headaches, muscle aches, or days when they felt fatigued. And Henry did sometimes have migraines from the late 1520s on, which some have connected to possible brain damage, though not me. See my video on whether he was brain damaged for more information. I'll leave that linked on screen and below for you. The problem, however, is that there is no evidence of prolonged episodes of any of these symptoms, and they can all be indicative of other problems. We also know that Henry and his queens were never treated for syphilis because there are no records of them being given mercury by their doctors, which was the standard treatment of the day. I can almost hear the typing of the comments I'm going to get though when this video goes live, saying things like, ah, but perhaps they were always in the latent phase and so no symptoms presented, or they were so mild that they went unnoticed. Okay, yes, that is theoretically possible, but then again, so is time travel. Let's think instead about how likely it is. For the syphilis theory to hold water, you have to argue that Henry had syphilis before or very soon after the time he married Catherine when he was still a teenager, that he infected woman after woman for the next 35 years, that their infections were severe enough to cause numerous lost pregnancies, but that neither he nor they ever displayed any overt symptoms of the disease. We also have to believe that Henry had syphilis, but didn't apparently infect any of his known mistresses, including Elizabeth Blunt, who went on to have six surviving children with her two husbands, and Mary Boleyn, who had two. What's more, you also have to argue that all of Henry's surviving four children managed to avoid having the disease, or at least displaying any symptoms of it, which is also verging on impossible if their mothers were infected. In a 2010 article in the Historical Journal, which looked at Henry's fertility problems, the authors note that as three of his children, Henry Fitzroy, Elizabeth and Edward, were the first he had with their mothers, quote, it could be argued that those infants survived because their mothers had not yet contracted syphilis from the king. But Henry and Catherine's fifth child, Mary, would have contracted congenital syphilis were syphilis to blame for Catherine's preceding miscarriages, end quote. They go on to point out that none of his children ever showed symptoms of congenital syphilis, which, as you can see from these historic images of the disease, can be very unpleasant. 
Admittedly, Mary was short-sighted, but that's a common problem then and now, and hardly proof of anything. We would also need to believe that Jane Seymour was sleeping with Henry on a regular basis from late May 1536 until at least January 1537, but didn't become infected and was therefore able to produce a healthy, non-syphilitic baby, Prince Edward. Finally, syphilis was a new disease in Europe during Henry's lifetime, and the population had little or no immunity to or tolerance for it. As the writer J.F.D. Shrewsbury wrote in 1952, when the syphilis theory was already being slammed by historians and doctors alike, from the early records of the disease that we possess, it is difficult to believe that Henry could have acquired it without exhibiting some of its repulsive skin lesions, and it is inconceivable that contemporary Catholic writers would have failed to blazon their presence. I hope this explanation has therefore proven to you, beyond any reasonable doubt, that Henry didn't have syphilis, and nor did any of his partners. It's an outdated 19th century theory based almost entirely on Catherine of Aragon's tragic obstetric history, and which modern medicine has thoroughly debunked. There are some ideas, though, which are more likely explanations for her sufferings, and for the reproductive experiences of Henry's other partners. Theory 3. Rhesus Incompatibility The rhesus phenomenon occurs when a woman who has the rhesus negative blood type becomes pregnant by a partner with rhesus positive blood. The first pregnancy will proceed normally, assuming there are no other problems, but a miscarriage or birth of a rhesus positive child to a rhesus negative mother will sensitize the mother to any future rhesus positive children and cause her to produce antibodies which will attack those children's blood. It's easily treated nowadays, but in the past could lead to miscarriages, stillbirths, or very poorly newborns who might well die soon after birth or suffer brain damage, learning problems, and sight and hearing loss. The rhesus problem is something which can't be ruled out for Henry and his children. If Henry was rhesus positive and his partners were rhesus negative, only first pregnancies and later pregnancies with children who were also rhesus negative, like their mothers, would be safe from being rejected by that mother's body. Henry Fitzroy, Elizabeth and Edward were all their mother's first children, and Catherine may have miscarried her first girl for other reasons, become sensitised to rhesus positive blood, then miscarried or had stillbirths for all her later rhesus positive children, with her New Year's Day boy of 1511 and Princess Mary being her only rhesus negative children. Equally, Elizabeth could have been rhesus positive, sensitised Anne Boleyn to the differing blood group during her birth in 1533, and thus inadvertently caused Anne's later pregnancy losses. Now let's look at another popular theory which bears some similarities to the rhesus problem. Theory 4. The Kell Blood Type to return to the 2010 article I mentioned earlier, as well as slamming the idea that Henry had syphilis, it posited that a more likely reason for the prenatal and neonatal deaths of so many of his children was that he and his partners were not Kell compatible. The Kell blood group, like the rhesus group, can produce a strong immune reaction, and should a man be Kell positive and a woman Kell negative, then we can expect to see a reproductive pattern very much like that observed with rhesus incompatibility. The first pregnancy with a Kell positive infant should be fine, barring other complications, but the mother will then become sensitised to the Kell positive blood during a miscarriage or birth as mother and child's blood will mix. This is called alloimmunisation. All future Kell positive children will then be rejected by her body. This fits with all of Henry's known partners and their reproductive careers. Catherine could have become sensitised during either of her first two pregnancies, resulting in multiple miscarriages, stillbirths, and premature short-lived children, with the exception of Mary if Mary was Kell negative like her mother. This could even account for the death, at 52 days old, of her son Prince Henry, as some Kell positive children can survive a few weeks. Anne may have become sensitised during the birth of Elizabeth, leading to subsequent miscarriages, or miscarried her second child for entirely different reasons, then become sensitised, resulting in the loss of her third pregnancy. As Bessie Blunt and Jane Seymour had only one pregnancy each by Henry, we cannot comment on whether Kell incompatibility would have been a problem for them. The authors of the 2010 article even postulate that Henry inherited his Kell positivity from his great-grandmother, Jaquetta of Luxembourg, for they argue that all of her male line descendants had reproductive problems, while the females generally did not, 
though given that a number of her male descendants didn't attempt to procreate for various reasons, I found that part of their argument quite weak. For theory five, I'm going to finish with an idea which is the simplest, but also often the most overlooked explanation, bad luck. This is the idea that there was nothing medically wrong with Henry or his partners, and that they simply spun the wheel of fortune and lost. They did, after all, live in an era when general health care and medicine were virtually non-existent compared to modern times, when women drank alcohol throughout their pregnancies, and when child and maternal mortality were much higher. Anne's record of one birth and two miscarriages doesn't strike me as particularly unusual given the time period, the fact that she was in her 30s, and the stress she was under to produce a boy. She herself blamed her 1536 miscarriage on the worry caused by Henry falling from his horse a few days earlier. Catherine, meanwhile, had a much poorer record, but two of her six pregnancies still produced full-term infants who lived beyond their first month, and the frequency of her pregnancies, at least six in nine years, cannot have helped, given the often short recovery times she had in between. Like Anne, she too was also under extraordinary pressure to produce a boy, and must have grown increasingly frantic with every loss. This whole conversation could ultimately boil down to poor fortune and bad medical care. To conclude then, I think we can rule out syphilis for Henry VIII, rule in some late-life impotency, and say that rhesus or kale incompatibility between him and one or more of his partners might account for why so many of his children died before or shortly after birth. As always, however, I'm interested to hear what you make of all this. Let me know in the comments section below what you think the most likely reason for the apparent fertility problems of the Tudors might be, and if you want to hear about a royal who clearly did have a medical problem affecting her ability to reproduce, see my video on Queen Anne Stuart. I'll be back next week with a new offering, and until then, keep learning.